Hey, a pleasant good evening, everybody. Welcome into the next edition of the JB and Steel Show. As I am joined by my wonderful co-host, Steel Flyers, as we're here to give you some talk on the AHL, NHL, some MLB talk as well as some NFL and basketball talk as well. Steel, how are you doing on this Monday evening? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm doing great, but I got to do something here. So just hold on a sec. <laughs> I got to turn on a light here that I forgot to turn on. <laughs> there, that makes it a little better, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay, cool. Now you can see me better. Anyway, I'm not so much in the dark. Speaking of being in the dark, man, I'll tell you what. Uh, we've had a lot of things come to light here, especially uh, in all of the leagues that we're going to talk about today. I'm doing great. Thanks for being here, Joe. Thanks for doing this, man. We are on volume 11 of the JB and Steel show. We're going to cover all kinds of different wonderful things here for you today on the show. First thing I think we're going to get into, though, is the AHL, where Joe's going to give us a, a great update on what's going on down there because it's getting close to playoff time and teams are jockeying for position. And Joe is our man on the ice, as it were, uh, in, in the minor leagues, and he's got that all covered up here. So let's start off with the leading teams in each of the divisions right now that are jockeying for position. And we'll start off with the... Uh, Let's go with the Atlantic Division, and the uh, <clears throat> Springfield is at the highest so far in that one, right? Yep. And then in the Central, you got Chicago, and then in the Pacific, uh, you got the uh, Stock. Is it Stockton? Oh yeah, Pacific Stockton, and then the Stockton? North is the uh, Utica Comets. Utica Comets. All right, so. Let's talk about the Atlantic, and let's break down the Atlantic real quick. Yeah, well, the Atlantic, uh, Springfield, they're coached by a former uh, lead defenseman, uh, Drew Bannister, who played with the uh, Tampa Bay Lightning for a clip. Uh, mm -hmm. they, have, they have a good mix. We, see, we saw Nathan Walker up a bit with the Blues playing solid when he had yeah. to kill it. Uh, they, are, they have a good mix of AHL veterans and guys like Logan Brown when he's down, who's been playing much better since going to their organization that also is trying to continue to prove himself, so brings that uh, valiant energy every night. Scott Puronovic is a defenseman that's continuing to develop and play really well. Uh, Sam Anas is continuing to develop. He has 40 points tied with Walker. Matthew Pekka, who's had some NHL experience, is their leading goal scorer for 42 points. And they got depth because they got all the way um, – down to their ninth scorer is above 20 points. Yeah, so right. they've been getting depth scoring. And then there's a bunch of guys tied with 17 points. There's three. And that, so the, the tell story for a lot of successful teams and not, and not just with them, but in most teams in the AHL is obviously great success um, when it comes to depth scoring, but also good success in net, which they have Charlie Lingren. Lingren yeah. Obviously one of the better, uh, AHL goaltenders, Colt Nellis has been fine. So, like, they, they have everything they need. And then Joel Hofer uh, hasn't been uh, bad in net for them either this year. At a, his goals against is a little bit higher than you would like, but his save percentage is at a 9 of 3. Uh, he's still continuing to grow. Um, so, I think they have a team that has very good veterans and guys that are kind of those underlooked, like the Scott Kuronovichs of the world. Uh, prospects that are not looked at as much as maybe they should be, or the Alexi. They also have Alexi Torchenko, uh, who's a very talented guy who eventually will probably be a part of the Blues lineup consistently. So, uh, I think the the Thunderbirds and Drew Hellison's team are positioned to definitely stay uh, in that top uh, seed. They would be my favorite because Providence and uh, Hartford, who I both think are great teams as well. They're, I don't know if they're going to have enough to, to catch Springfield at this point. Um, they're going to have to go on a run, and Springfield's going to have to go on a decent run. Yeah, I was just going to say, Springfield, 28, 15, and 5. Um, Providence is at 24, 14, and 3. And Hartford is at 25, and 16, and 4. 
So, and they've all played. Providence has got a lot of games in hand, like six games in hand. Yep. You know what I mean? So that potentially is going to be helpful for them down the road if they can win those games in hand. That has to be the key for them. Obviously, moving forward is winning those games in hand, of course. You know what I mean? Because they're not that far back. Do you know what I mean? No, and Horford has three games at hand, so if they can win all of those, that would help them a lot as well. Exactly, exactly. Where Hershey, who's in fourth, is above them actually in a game. And Charlotte is even with them in games. So, like, I don't think those teams have much of a... Yeah, that's why, yeah. ...to catch the top. Right, right, right. I'm with you on that. So, there you go. It looks like Springfield, Providence, and Hartford are going to be the teams coming out of there. I would say they would be the top three where uh, Springfield... um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Ryan, uh, I usually mispronounce his last name, but Mo, Mo, G, Mo Gino, I think is how you say his last name. This was his first season yeah. um, with the with the Providence Bruins. And uh, obviously, I think whenever your team's doing that good in your first season, when it's not like everyone talks about the Bruins having the most uh, out, like wonderland prospects in the world. Uh, he, he's been doing a good job with the Jack of Cons of the world. He's been doing yeah. a good job with the yeah. Edward uh, Troll Mocks of the world, even Coppin. Uh, I've watched them play a good bit this year. Um, Sessions even play, even though he doesn't want to be there anymore, he's played solid for him. Stadnika, yeah. uh, Froden, Fogarty, Cameron Hughes has been fantastic uh, for the PR Bruins at left wing. So I think, I think they're a team. The the only thing that I think is going to hold them back is they again have depth scoring. They have their nice yes, scorer they do. has nineteen, they're, yeah. they're, and then they have Coppin and other guys like like Luco, Felipe, who have the skill. They just haven't fully figured it out in yeah. the AHL yet. So yeah. um, once that happens, that can help. And then in net, you have um, Cole uh, Kess- Kaiser, who's been pretty good. They also have have had. Gilly's play for them this year, who's obviously a veteran. Callum Booth has played for them, and then they've had Troy Groznick. So they've had different goalies oh, come yeah. through. But, yeah, for but sure. They, but they've been able to figure it out, and uh, Groznick's uh, been pretty darn good in 19 games played. He has a 924 to 216 for the PR. Wow, that's road. pretty good. So that's, that's uh, I think good. they're getting yeah, it I mean, done in net. Yeah, yeah. They just have to be a little bit more consistent at defense, and yeah. then they have a chance to be in contention for the Calder, but I definitely would obviously put the first place Springfield Thunderbirds ahead of them because they have a little bit of things that might catch them in the playoffs compared to yeah, the Thunderbirds. No, no, that makes sense. Things that'll probably catch up to them. I mean, that makes sense, especially with, with Springfield having that depth and scoring. Do you know what I mean? That's where I think it's going to help them, especially in the in the playoffs down down the stretch there too. You know what I mean? Yeah. So and then Steel, we know the Wolfpacks head coach. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, Chris Nobla, a former um, Flyers assistant, has been doing a good job. Other oh, than man. Um, with the with the Harford Wolfpack, uh, somebody that certain uh, people uh, hope comes back uh, potentially as well. Uh, he has a very good AHL. I might be one of them. <laughs> veteran, yeah. Um, he has a couple of good guys that have been a- AHL players. Uh, in yeah. Anthony Greco playing great. Johnny Brzezinski yeah. playing great. Yeah. Ty Roning, yeah. Tanner Fritz, Tim Gedinger, uh, Padre Niemi uh, has a chance to still develop. Uh, Zach Jones has played great for him. Uh, Padre Niemi looks like he might end up being an NHL or not everybody knew if that would be the case exactly. with how good Nobla has him playing. Uh, Rudinin's played good. Uh, Morgan Barron's been a very good big body presence on the ice for him. And then he has Schneider on defense. They have a very good defense, too. Hunter Skinner when they're down, Lundquist. Right. Whatever Hijig's down, they have Hijig. They got Jeff Taylor. Uh, they, they got they, they put together a very good team. Adam Puska's uh, been good at net. Keith Kincaid might not have been great in the NHL in his career, but he is a very solid uh, AHL goalkeeper. Hey, some so, guys just... Some guys just, you know, I mean, some guys just don't get it. And some guys just yeah. make it in he, the he NHL. He has a 270, yeah. exactly. And he's been great this year. Adam Huska is only 24. He only got one game and got roughed up by one of the league's best teams. So we'll see what he can continue to do doing good in the AHL. They have a really good team. I also think um, Chris Nobla, similar to how in the NHL level, they're over. They have guys playing 
quicker than I think developing quicker than they thought they would. That's what Noblah has their yeah. AHL team and the Hartford Wolfpack doing. That is really helping them immensely, just like Gallant has doing uh, for the New York Rangers uh, at the NHL level. So I think they're a team that's going to be competitive for it, but I'm not sure if I would rank the Wolfpack in the top three for Calder. They would be probably in your top seven. Yeah, okay, I would have to agree with you on that just because, uh, now, I mean, they still have quite a bit of games in hand, but still, you know, when you look at, at the rest of the league, like we're, we're going to dive into the Central Division next, right? And their they're he- they're leading uh, team has only got 48 games played, which is still four games uh, in hand for, for Hartford, but they have a better winning percentage at .708. Do you see what I mean? So, I mean, uh, that's going to be the key, I think, for for them, the Wolfpack, is if they can win those games in hand for sure. And if they can, then I think that might that might get them to where they need to go. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the Wolfpack also need to improve, though, in the little spurts because they've been fine, 5-4-1, and one, but they've had Providence has been to a 7-3 and three tier uh springfield lost in a shootout so they're seven two and then with the shootout loss yeah so Mm -hmm. they need to kind of try to stick there um as well and also the thing with them is they're not that far ahead of hershey so they need to try to stay ahead of the hershey regardless of the world as well exactly exactly so and with that we're going to move into the central division and uh with that being said now we've got the uh the um Point seven zero eight with the Chicago Wolves leading the uh, Central Division here. Um, so I mean, and they only have forty eight games played, um, and so that uh, thirty ten and four. I mean, that's pretty impressive if you ask me. No, yeah, I think I think it's really impressive, and you know. Ryan Worsowski's, uh, we're not picking the easiest names to pronounce with the guys. I mean, player. you know. <laughs> but, uh, but he led the team in his first season um, yeah. to the Central Division title. It looks like he has a very good chance in his second season of leading the Wolves to the Central Division title. They tend to be one of the better teams in the AHL every season. Yeah. Um, and they're doing it again. They have one of the best by far, who also got a chance to play in the NHL. So congratulations to him. Uh, this year with Carolina, but Andrew Pohorowski, one of the best players in the AHL, 66 points, 22 goals, 44 points in uh, 45 games. And then on top of having him, you also have Stefan Notion, one of the best AHL players, who's at 50 points through 43. And then just to throw it in there, they also have C.J. Smith, who's one of the fastest AHL players, <laughs> who's also good, who has 45 points uh, in 42 games. And then Jack Drury, who went not with the um, – Keynes is obviously one of their best prospects who's killing the AHL and had 32 points in 45. David Gust has been good. Josh Levo, Joey Keane, who's going to be a good defenseman, I think, for Carolina when they yeah, need I think him. So too, the yeah. Joy's very good back there. Seth Jacobs, very good um, AHL defenseman. Same with Chatfield. Um, same with Ke- uh, Kevon Fitzgerald. I almost said Kevin because that's just a more common name. Um, and then Sarikoff has also been good on the back end. Ryan Suzuki's developing, but in the games he's played, uh, the 16 games he played, he looked fine. So, I mean, I think everything's coming good for them. They got uh, good good players in, in in net as well. A former guy that we also know from the from the Phantoms, Alex Lyon is one of them. E2 Maka, Makaniemi is another one. Um, and then Jack LaFontaine, who they pulled out of college, uh, who's yeah. now in the organization's played in seven games. So they added him, who was one of the most talented college net minders. Already have in mocking the Emmy, who's an underrated oh, goal prospect. I really, I really like and then, that often. Whoa, you can't, yeah, so it, we're falling over here. And then Alex Lyon, who has always been good at the AHL level, and that's all they want him to be because they have good goaltending at the NHL level. So, yeah. and he did fine in the game he filled in. So, I think they're a team a lot. I would put them above the Thunderbirds in my ranking for top quarter contenders. The Thunderbirds I, would right now be second, yeah. the Wolves would be. First, if we're looking at top teams in the division, I would have to put the Wolves with how stacked their roster is. 
And even on top of that, how good their goaltending is with an AHL veteran, yeah. Mario Makaniemi and LaFontaine, and two very good long, youngsters. Yeah, yeah. That, that goes La- a long way. I really like that LaFontaine. Um, really, I've watched a um, couple of his games already, seen a cu- couple of his um, highlights as well, too. I mean, that kid just really is playing really well. Really like his game uh, for sure. Um, one of the teams are the, that, I mean, and I agree with you on that, I would have to put Chicago ahead. Um, as well, too. They have a much better record. They're a much better stacked team. I think they're a much better complete team. You know what I mean? Their their um, power play and penalty killing numbers are much better across the board. You know what I'm saying? So uh, one of the other teams, though, you got to talk about those the Manito- Manitoba Moose coming on in the Central as well, too. Not that far back. Excuse me. Not that far back from Chicago, but I mean... I would say they're still maybe even a little bit ahead of some of the other teams. Do you know what I mean, though? The Central Division's a tough division, so if I had to hand compared to the – not that the Atlantic's not a great division, but this year I would say the Central uh, with how Roxford has played, how Grand Rapids yeah. has played, even if you go all the way down to Iowa – they're at a 500 percentage right now. Uh, yeah. If you go down to the sixth-place team in our division – the P- Pittsburgh's at a uh, Wilkesbury, excuse me, at 520, but then Lee has at 479, 461 for Bridgeport. So I think the Central's been a little bit stronger this year. Manitoba's been a really good team. Lately, they've had some ugly games, only been four and six of late. So they kind of got to get their twine going in the great direction because also Detroit's team of Grand Rapids, uh, even though percentage wise, they're not above Roxford. Uh, they have a 520, but they are above them in points, and they've been seven and three. They've been one of the hottest teams of late. They're all the way down in fifth. But yeah. if teams like Roxford um, keep struggling, they could ca- start making inroads. And then exactly. if you continue to go four and six, that's not going to help you out. So Milwaukee, I think, has been a fantastic team this year. Uh, Mark Morrison is their head coach. I think for them, they're the team uh, that I, I had in my mind as soon as I. I uh, thought we were going to talk about this. That was need to pick it, pick the wheels, get the wheels turning again. But they they are literally the epitome of depth because nobody is the fantastic scorer on their team. Their leading scorer has twenty six points, um, and he's a defenseman, Gawonki. Gaw- and then it's a uh, Morellis, then it's Malo, um, then it's a uh, Cole Mayer, uh, a Mal- uh, and a Mayer. All both have twenty two. Uh, Morellis is twenty three. Right. Um, so, like, everybody – and then if you go all the way down to their 18th score, they're above double digits. But they don't have – their team has literally been by everybody, by committee, where that's something that's great. And I love when you have teams do that because that's fun to watch when you don't just have only – a team that has the top carrying rate. They're kind of like the Islanders when the Islanders are successful. Uh, yeah. or Like or the, the Islanders of, yeah. of, of the AHL, everybody for Hellison's team – it, it, or from not Helson, from Morrison's team, excuse me, is just kind of doing their thing and pulling their weight for him. And nobody has to carry that team because they just got a bunch of guys that that, that work uh, really well together. Um, Mikel Burdine is not bad in that. Uh, they have solid guys in that. Burdine's actually been good in that. Two, nine, 903, I didn't even realize he's had, pulled his numbers up that high in 244. So he's... Um, since the last time I looked over a month ago, even improved his numbers. So uh, I think they're a team that's going to be really interesting to watch because they play a good playoff style where everybody is a pain in the ass. And when you have a team like that, that <laughs> might be a team that could be a dark horse to make yeah. a run. But they, but the one thing that they are faltering on that we've seen hurt teams like the Islanders, teams like uh, other teams even that that have that, even like the Wild last year, is in the end when you're in a game seven with Vegas, do you have that dude that's going to pull it above the four dudes that they have exactly. that are above like 55 exactly. points, 65 points, like the Polterowski's, the notions we just talked about with Chicago. Do you have the guys that are going to stack up to that? That's the only concern with exactly. a team like them. Now, speaking of guys that, you know, can do that and can score and can carry you and stuff like that. And we we talked about this at the at the top here a little bit and we're gonna move into the North Division here. We're gonna talk about Utica 
and how they are now leading at 0.713 percentage. Uh, they've played 47 games. They're 31, 11, and 5. And yeah, they well, are <clears throat> the top of the – no, they're not – they're what, second? Yeah, they're second. Yeah, they're second, I think, Stockton percentage-wise. Stockton is, is point seven four four, and then it's Utica at point seven one three, and then uh, Ontario is point seven one one, and then Chicago is point seven zero eight. Yeah. 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 Um, so, all right. So, anyway, North Division – Utica now with forty seven games played at point seven one three. Would we say they were now third in the in the in the league? Yeah, yeah, you were saying um I mean they're a team they've been ridiculous the entire season from the jump. I mean, uh Kevin Deneen is probably a name that a lot of people will recognize in the hockey sphere. He's the head coach of the Utica Comets. Um I, I think uh they're a team he had them going they were like 18-0 and whatever the heck they would have like they were on a ridiculous start to the season have still been great since they have guys that i think they're using that slow but steady development like the fabian zetterloon is a perfect example of someone that probably eventually his birth year was 1999 so he still has a couple years to develop until he's really in his prime years so i think they're just taking the slow and steady because he's been killing it with the mean so they figure let's just let him flourish down there have him up at high confidence. Chase DeLeo's been good sure. in the AHL. He's killing it. Alexander Holtz is lighting up the AHL when he's down there. Wiley Walsh, A.J. Greer, all those guys. Uh, Nate Snor has taken a next step up. Uh, I've watched him a couple of times live when they were still in Binghamton when right. I was uh, nice. at PPL. Uh, so he's he's taken a next step. Same with Nolan Foote. Uh, and then for them, until you get under the 16 points, you have to go all the way down to their 14th guy, who is actually a pretty good player, too, and Brian Flynn, who's a good skating center that can actually shoot the puck. And then on defense, you don't have to worry about that because Kevin Ball's a very good prospect. Vukasevic is a very solid prospect. Tyler Weitherspoon's a great AHL veteran. Uh, so they got they got a very good mix. Uh, Grillo is also a very good veteran. Then you got Akira Schmid, who's been especially in times one of the hottest goaltenders in the entire league and then nico goals who also is one of the better young goaltenders as well and then someone that isn't even a bad uh third string either he's struggling this year but he's had his moments um is uh marrick's middens uh especially where well, last year he had a 281 at 899 this year he's struggling more at a 366 874 but he's a guy if he's your third stringer like that's a pretty good third stringer to have, which is what the situation yeah. is with the Utica Comets. So I think they are a team similarly to the Chicago Wolves that are kind of right there with having just the great players that you don't see anything that's going to really stop them unless if the, it's just the, the playoffs of how hockey is. You have teams like the Moose that yeah. I said that yeah. go on great runs. You can have somebody in their division – that plays them, for example, um, let's just say it's Laval. And then Laval has a fantastic series against them. And, and, and that's just how that's it is. It. They're yep. also a good team, but just not as on paper stacked up to the Utah. Yep. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Um, do we even talk about the Marlies? Uh, they have 43 games played, man. They have one of the lowest amounts of games played at 24 and 15 at 0. 0.605 percentage. They're still, I believe, too far away, I think. Yeah, Greg Moore, actually, who's a former player, a guy that was a little bit tough, tough bones, guy that was fun to watch a little bit in his day, um, for, played, was drafted by the Flames, uh, played for the Isles, I think, for a bit, too. But uh, he's, he's their coach. I think their team, because of their under amount of games played, have to, by default, fall into that Manitoba moose category of like, they could be scary because you haven't even seen them enough where that's, that's why true. you're going by the points percentage. And I think they're a team on defense. Uh, Dahlstrom has been fine. Um, Hallowell has been good on offense. You actually have one of the better scores in uh, Brett Sene 
Um, and yeah. then you have one of the best passers um on from defense um in, in Duzak um back there, and then uh Alex uh, Stevies has also been very good for them. And then yeah. Joey Anderson, he's yeah. one of those guys like you mentioned earlier, not everyone figures it out fully at the A at the NHL, but does great at the AHL level. And then Andy Shamala, who eventually would probably be up. Uh th- they have a, a, a good form team. Um their their thing for me is gonna be uh you kind of have had like Walls played ten games, Hutchinson's played eleven, uh Eric Calgren one of their young goaltenders, he's played the most at 23, and he's been good. So he's the guy I would continue to ride, but he's young. He's he's the guy that has the least um, AHL experience, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see if they decide to do that because Michael Hutchinson is the veteran. But if you go by how they're playing this year, I would definitely say you don't want to ride the veteran in Michael Hutchinson. He hasn't been that sharp in 11 games. Wall's actually been better than him. That's why he's been up with Toronto. Uh, right. So I would ride uh, Colgren to just keep letting him play great as a, as a youngster. That that would be the only concern with the Marlies, their experience in net compared to the other teams we talked about. I got you. Okay. I mean, you know, look, either way you slice it, I think this is going to be another competitive division, um, and it's going to come down here because – with Utica at 47 games played and then Toronto and 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 uh, Lavia at 43 and 42 respectively um I, there's going to be some room for jockeying there's going to be Laval some Laval is the uh Laval Pirlo I'm sorry me. yeah Pierlo yeah. corrected me in that when I was said it wrong on his show okay uh when uh, but Laval has 42 games played Right. And Toronto has 43. So, I mean, you know, there's still a lot of games left to be played there that they have in hand and and their percentage points are not that bad off and their winning is not that bad off either. You know what I mean? So they do have a shot as well, too. But And then the two teams we're going to end on are the two most exciting battled out division where Stockton and Ontario have kind of been right on top of each other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and- the entire and Bakersfield season. trying to put its nose in there. Oh, yeah, and Bakersfield's definitely in the Marley. I don't know if they're fully with the Moose. Like, I would put out of Dark Horse teams the Moose on top, and then the Marleys and the Condors in the same category. All right, where yeah. I, where I think the Condors are a team, obviously, uh, their head coach is now up coaching in the NHL with the Edmonton Oilers, but yeah. they're a team that has continued to still get production um, over the top of what they expected from some, and that that obviously goes a long way. And uh, I, I think that's um, that's what's going to continue for them, and that's why I would put them in that dark horse category. But I would say the Moose is the top dark horse one. I would agree right now, and then the Marleys and uh, the Bakersfield Condors fall into the second tier when it comes to. It. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that because Stockton thirty nine and three. With only 43 games played. Holy smackers. I mean, that's like pretty reminiscent of like Carolina or Florida. The yeah, big, they're 39, the, uh, 39, 9, and 3. Because 3 yeah. is good. Yeah, it's 30. But, but they've been, I mean, the Heat have been ridiculous. They've been, uh, for pun intended, have had a lot of love in their play this season. And they're coached by Mitch Love. So, uh, he he's brought the love. Oh gosh! To, to stop, Zer- to stop. Oh um, man! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> but uh, Matthew Phillips has been a fantastic. Uh, yeah. Well, him and, and uh, Pelletier is probably going to be up eventually. Have been fantastic. Was forty-seven for Phillips. Pelletier is forty-one. Gordon mm-hmm. has forty points. So they got three guys above the 40-point threshold. And then, uh, let's see here, one, two, three, four. Four in the, in the 20s with Luke Phillip having the most. Connor Mackey has exactly. always is a, been a very good undrafted signing that probably could eventually even play at the NHL level. So And Byron Froese, who's actually spent some time with the Phantom, has always been a good uh, AHL center. So the, the, they got it done. Connor Zare is a very good player. Obviously, Yusuf Alamaki. I think is still going to end up eventually becoming a solid defenseman who's already shown signs throughout his career. Uh, Colton Pullman um, is is very good in the back end, and then when it comes in in uh, net for them, 
uh, Adam Warner has been fine. And then Dustin Wolf is an absolute tank as a young goaltender uh, in net down there. He has a 9 2 4, 22 wins to only four losses and three OT losses and a 231. So uh, they're definitely set in net and they're set as a whole. I would say Mitch Love's team, uh, they're one of the top contenders with, I would say, the Chicago Wolves uh, to be there for the, or yes, for the Calder Cup. And then the other team that actually is probably a top contender with the Wolves is oddly enough um, in their division, which is the Ontario Reign. Because yes, I think Utica is also a top contender, but I think by default they would become fourth just because you you would put it Chicago, then you would put it um, probably, I would say, Stockton, Ontario, because those two teams are battling out the gauntlet. And then Utica would then by just default at that point fall into your fourth spot. And then your fifth spot is Springfield, who, again, I think is a team that has. So, so basically what I'm saying right now is I think this is going to be a great quarter cup playoffs because I think five teams have a very legitimate chance to, to win it with those dark horse teams like the Hartfords, the um, the Toronto Marlies, the Manitoba Mooses, and the Condors that we talked about as well, falling in suit behind them. Um, and those are teams that I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of leapfrog and are able to actually get it done. I'm with you on that for sure. Currently, right now, the standings are this. Stockton Heat at .744. Utica Comets at .713. Ontario Rain .711. Um, Chicago Wolves at point seven zero eight, and the Springfield Thunderbirds at point six three zero. Big significant distance there between fourth and fifth. But then you got the teams just like we talked about: the Bakersfield Condors, the Providence Bruins, the Manitoba Moose, the Toronto Marlies. I mean, they're all in that pack right there where a four or five game swing because they, some of these teams in the lower side, especially like the Condors, the Bruins, you know, the Moose have some games in hand, you know what I mean? So it's, 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 it's pretty much up for grabs. I'm pretty excited to see how this is going to go. And I agree. I think this is going to be some pretty seriously awesome uh, playoffs coming up here real soon for, for the uh, AHL man, for sure. For sure. When it comes to stars to close out the, the, on top of the one of the guys favored to win the MVP with Podorowski would be TJ Tynan, who is now with the Reign, um, who are one of the other, obviously the other top team of the Heat's division. And uh, John uh, Roblowski has coached them pretty well. Tynan's played well. Martin Furk, who's never found his way fully in the NHL, has been great for them in the AHL. Uh, Jared Anderson Dolan, he started to develop really nicely. Same with Velarde, he's played well down there. Jordan Spence, Tyler uh, Madden, um, relation to a very uh, known um, man in a different sport. Uh, Sam, <laughs> but really, um, Vladimir Tikashev, Austin Wagner, Aiden Dudas, Alex Turcotte. So, like the list goes on with that team. Uh, I think they're a well put together uh, team I have as to well. Agree. Have to agree. As in conclusion, and then also Matthew Vallada is one of the better young netminders down there as well. So um, that they got it done, and uh, he looks like he might become one of those sneaky, eventually develop him into your backup uh, to whoever becomes the future starter there in L.A. I'm with you on that for sure, man. All uh, either way, it still boils down to some pretty exciting AHL playoff hockey coming up here really soon. Uh, we're down to about the final like, two-ish months because of, yeah, there's only like yeah. uh, maybe twenty. <laughs> Supposed to be the end of April, yeah. By the time the season ends, assuming nothing has to get pushed back again, okay. and they don't do anything. Yeah, so. okay. So they only play, what, 76 games? Yeah, yeah, I believe it's 76. In the 76 NHL. games. I always so... confuse the numbers because they're different in all three leagues. Right, okay. Yeah. So the AHL plays 76 games. 
we are definitely fast approaching that with some teams at, at 50 games played already. Uh, you know what I mean? So we're definitely fast approaching um, that mark and looking forward to seeing um, how teams are going to jockey for position, especially coming down to the wire. Um, next week, we're going to break down the ECHL um, and give you a breakdown of what's going on there, too, because those guys are also getting close to playoff time and, and, and breaking things down there, too. So we'll break that down for you guys next week. That'll be the ECHL next week on the JB and Steel Show. Right now, though, we're going to get into um, the senior circuit, and that will be the big the big boys, the big guys, the guns, the head cheeses, the NHL, the National Hockey League, where everybody aspires to be, especially those guys in the AHL. Uh, you know, they want to try to stay up here and try to play up here and everything like that. So uh, one of the first things I want to say right off the bat is – we here at Steel Flyers, we here at JB and Steel, um, we don't talk about anything political. Uh, we don't get into any of those types of things. Um, we are not part of that platform. That's not what we're trying to do. That's that's not what we do. We're, we're, our opinions are just that, our opinions. And we're here to bring you the information about the game, the sport, the teams, and, and what's going on on the ice and on the field. And, and so, but sometimes um, life bleeds into sports, okay? And right now, uh, the National Hockey League uh, released a statement um, with regards to Russia's invasion to the, to the Ukraine. Um, and the um, statement from um, the National Hockey League is that they have suspended all of their um, relationships uh, with their business partners in Russia. And so that's uh, what the NHL has come out and said. So um, just wanted to say that, like I said, we don't talk about anything political. We're not here to get in any of that kind of stuff. But sometimes life bleeds into sports, and this is now affected sports. So this is why we're going to kind of talk about the fact that the NHL made this statement. So. What do you think about this, Joe? I mean, do you think this was the right move here for the NHL to come out and make a statement like this? I think they had to because the IIHF obviously came down hard. So I think the NHL yeah. didn't have a – I mean, they had to say something. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the NHL was ever going to suspend Russian players like Dominic Hasek, uh was saying because it's not their fault that right. that happened. Uh, right. Where – the only reason I think the IIHF did it is because Russia's honored on a world stage at IIHF. I agree, yes. You're not honored on a world stage playing in the NHL. You're just doing what you do to make a living and doing the thing you love. That's so. Exactly. That's a perspective. I agree. No, I agree 100%. And, and that's something else, too, where the IIHF uh, has come out and they – uh, what they severed all ties for from Russia, or they or said have, Russia and Belarus are banned are indefinitely banned. from any IIHF events, and then they pulled the 2023 World Junior Classic, which was set for I don't know what part of Russia, but somewhere in Russia, out of Russia. Oh, okay. So okay, so there you go. So, like I said, unfortunately, sometimes life bleeds into the sports. Um, and this is just what we have to report. This is what we have to bring you uh, because we're trying to bring you the truth and what's going on here. And the NHL came out and made a statement based off of – and I think you're right, Joe. I think it was based off of what the IIHF has, has done, and they kind of were taking the keys from them and and kind of came out and said something. The, the NHL did, I believe, at least anyway. At least that's that's, that's my opinion. You know, look – we're not diplomats. We're not professionals. That's just our opinion. No, no, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. But let's get into um, you bet, some of the talk about. We talked about the Chicago um, Wolves, so why don't we talk about the Carolina Hurricanes? Uh, yeah, let's do that. The, Car the Carolina Hurricanes are coached by former uh, Philadelphia Flyer, former Carolina Hurricane, a guy that still um, outbenches some of the players on his team, Rod Brindle. Um, he's still in better shape than some of the players than, on the so team, I some think. people playing in the league. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <You> know? <laughs> but when you look at their team, talk about 
um, depth, you figure, all the way down to Brady Shea, he has 22 points and has been obviously very good. Cockney has 22 tied with him. Oh, man. Vegas is at 28. Niederreiter is at 28. Slavin's at 29. Uh, Trochik's at 36. D'Angelo's at 40, who's banged up right now, but he's been great <laughs> this season. Tira Vine is at 43. Spechnikov's at 50. And Ajo's at 55. We're top three in goals because uh, I don't feel like reading 10 people again, uh, is Sebastian Ajo, then Andre Sveshnikov, and then Nito Niederreiter, who's been very good this year for them. And then oh Kakaniemi, some people think has been bad, hasn't. He just hasn't been fantastic. He has 11 goals and, again, had the 22 points. So he hasn't been great, but he hasn't been bad either. Uh, their big thing, though, is on top of their great defense, you got the D'Angelo, Slavens, Peches. Uh, oh, my gosh. Myths, even uh, coals of the world uh, on your defense. Slavins. But, yeah, the Jacob Slavins of the world. Yeah, obviously. you know, gosh. So, uh, when you have that great defense, but you also have two goaltenders, one that has a 244 goals against in Ronta, and one that has a 203, and then one that has a 930 save percentage in Anderson and a 909 in Ronta, they definitely, uh, I think it's the William Jennings, right, for the best goaltender. Or is that the Masterston? I always get confused. Oh, no. Masterson is um, is like what uh, Lindblom won. OK, yeah, you're right. So the William Jennings is the one then that I think is the one the Bruins kept racking up when it was two Garrett. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what they it. Had. So I, I, I that's think goalie they're definitely trophy, yeah. one of the favorites. Yeah, they're definitely one of the favorites for that. Plus, they've been able to get one from aforementioned Jalen Shatfield. Um, some production from the back end. Drury's been good when he's been caught up. Seth Jarvis is 19 rookie points. Joey Keane has been in a couple games. So no matter who subbed into that lineup, it, it's just been smooth sailing with Rob Brindamore's team. You know, you can't say enough about this team. And we've talked about this team um, in the uh, Off the Wall Hockey Show on numerous occasions, they've been in our power rankings, gosh, almost since jump, the beginning of the season. You know what I mean? Look, let's face it. They have only have 11 regulation losses on the season at 52 games played. Shut up. Okay, seriously. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they are at a plus 60 goal differential. They are... 37, 11, and 4 with 52 games played. Now, they're 6, 2, and 2 in their last 10 games, and they've won five in a row. And it doesn't matter that the entire goalie room was replaced this past offseason, right? Seriously. And, and they lost one of their quote-unquote best defensemen, quote-unquote, and none of that mattered. They're a better team this year than I think they were last year. Yeah, well, it goes with what we talked about with other teams before, whether it's on this show, whether Fearless talked about it on his show, John talked about yeah. it on his show. But when you have the right vibes surrounding your team culture, whatever you want to call it, that that goes a long way. And It seems like no matter anybody that goes into not just the um, Wolves, but goes into the Hurricanes, they tend to get their game projecting <laughs> well. So, Pearl is all about that, man. He, he's all so, about um, that. So I think they're a team. It's the two C's. We'll get to the Avalanche later. Right. But the two C teams that tend to be at the top of your list and when it comes been. to top contenders in the Avalanche and Hurricanes. In the Hurricanes of uh, Carolina and the Avalanche of Colorado. And have been. Since the beginning, and and here's the scary part: the next two teams are the Florida teams, the Sun Belt teams are right there nipping at the heels, and have been all season long. We're talking about Florida. We're talking about Tampa Bay, the defending champs, and look. I really, John and I from Off the Wall Hockey really feel that Carolina or Colorado potentially could get to 60 wins this season. They we might are, be able to. They would, they would be the teams to do it. Right. 
Okay, so we're looking for a team to finally get that to that 60 game win mark. And I think Colorado or Carolina could be one of those teams to do it. What do you think? Let's see. Carolina's at 37 through 52. Colorado's at 53-39. I would give Colorado with that the slight edge. Um, but not by much. I would give them the slight edge, though, since they are at 39 with one more game. So, But, yeah, I, I would say both teams have a chance to do it. But when it comes to the Metro, since we're just talking about uh, with the NHL, we'll give you the top three uh, check-in. Another team that some people thought wasn't going to be in the playoffs this year, even here at the Steel Flyers All Sports Network, where I was the one up until they get rid of Crosby, the Tang, and Malkin, they're making the playoffs. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and long and behold, uh, Mike Sullivan has the, uh, the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins uh, in the postseason again, uh, who are now plus 30, 33, 14, and 8 with 74 points at a .673 points percentage uh, at this stage, um, where, again, they, they've just been an impressive uh, team that has, has been able to do it well. Uh, Crosby isn't even their leading points guy. He's three behind Gensel. Uh, Gensel has been good. like the first two uh, and a half months of the season. Oh, yeah. and then he, but, but then he's come back and been great. The tang has been fantastic. Rough. Oh, yeah. Has been great. Rodriguez went cold, Jeff but he's Carter. still been good throughout the season. They got Jeff Carter. Um, um, Gensel's even though, been playing real well. Yeah, and and the and the scary thing for their team is you have a couple guys. You you have Dayton Heine playing above his head. Uh, you got the Brock McGinn's who pl- has played solid for you. But the scary thing about them is a guy that could be huge for them is a sleeper, scary guy in the playoffs is Coppening because he's been yeah. This all year, yeah, I'm with where you. you know he has a lot more in the yeah, tank. Yeah. That if he get, is one of those guys that goes on one of those streaks in the postseason, like we've seen the Sam Bennett's of the world go on, well, that makes that team even that much more I dangerous, and agree. that's what's scary for them. A thing that will be interesting for them is uh, Matheson. Let's see here. It says he's week to week, so depending how that goes will be interesting to see what they try to do with defense because Rue Weedle stepped up and it was smart to extend him for 800K for a couple of years, I believe. But I Mark Friedman's been solid, but Mark Friedman's not a guy you want consistently in your lineup. So if Matheson's banged up a little bit more, are they going to let P, uh, POJ kind of take the reins then and let him get more time at the NHL level? Or are they going to be one of those teams that maybe gets since he's a lefty that they're missing, get one of those lefty veterans yeah, on the market. And, uh, th- that will be the one interesting thing I, I would see for Pittsburgh. But but in net, obviously, Tristan Yari's been good. And DeSmith, who started cold, has started picking it coming up on. more of yep. late and mm-hmm. been getting going. So if he can keep coming on to give Yari more rest, who's been, I would say, a bit overworked because of DeSmith's early struggles, and that's only going to help them that much more. But. I agree. I agree. And I was actually going to say that was going to be my key for Pittsburgh has been the goaltending, believe it or not, where at one point that was one of their weaknesses is now I think you can honestly say that in Pittsburgh, that's not necessarily one of their weaknesses. I mean, Jari went to the all-star game. Okay. So, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, Pittsburgh just doesn't go away, man. They they just are always in it. They're always there. They always have a, a, a foot in it. They always are, you know, I mean, last year they surprisingly won the division. Right? Yeah. You you know, and nobody was picking them and, and nobody was expecting Pittsburgh to just come out of nowhere and oh, they won the division. Well, well. I, I don't think they're going to win a division this year, but, 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 but. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, <laughs> no um, I, 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 don't, I don't think so either, but. No, um, no. But, but they've been the playing really lit- well, though, and I, I have to tell you, I've been impressed. I'll tell you who else I've been really impressed with, too, and that's the New York Rangers. I've really been impressed with the New York Rangers playing as of late. Have not been impressed with Washington. No, they've declined big time since the start yeah. of 20, since the New Year calendar, exactly. uh, where the Rangers 
Um, and of course, obviously, the Penguins and the Hurricanes have all continued to mm-hmm. tick upward. Zachary Jones is a prospect that's going to continue to get better for the Rangers. Braden Schneider, they've already given them opportunities on their third line when they've been up. So they're getting their young guys cups of coffee. It's kind of by default because of some injuries that have happened yep. to them and so on. So, yep. But it is what mm-hmm. it is. Um, Kako's been banged up, but he's actually been good this year. Sammy Blay's been banged up, and he's a pretty solid a guy that can be pesky on both ends. So if you get him in for the playoffs, that yep. adds a sneaky guy mm-hmm. too. Barron, again, we talked about him when it came to Hartford, a good big body. Uh, so th- they have it all going for them. So Sturkin is also one of the Vezina leading candidate. I and agree. even though Gorgiev Gorg- is struggling this year, I think he's one of those guys that falls into how for some reason – with Ms. Lincolns, the Blue Jackets play much better, and with Corpus Salo, they don't. With the Rangers, they tend to – Sturkin's great, and he saves their bacon sometimes, as Jim Jackson would say, but at the same time, they tend to play smoother and firm. So I think uh, – Yeah, I'm with you on that. Gord, I think yeah. Gordiev has always been a better goalie than he is, and I think, like, the Smith are figuring it out over time, but at the same time, if they flip him for another goalie that somebody else is saying – Maybe it's time to move on from him because he hasn't worked out. Like, even if they did with Columbus, like, do you want uh, Gorgiev to try to develop him into Merzl- – you get him going again into yeah, Lincoln's backup yeah. and give us Corpy. And then we'll have Corpy behind, and it'll kind of be like, these two guys are kind of done their reign with our teams. Let's flip them, and one will come to you, and the other will come to us type. Exactly. Thing. No, I'm with you on that one for sure. Well, I'll tell you what, man. Uh we, we got a lot of great NHL stuff we talked about. We talked about a lot of great um, AHL stuff. I want to get um, a quick little um, blurb here on this real quick, just because um, I know it hasn't happened yet, and it's still in a lockout situation with the Major League Baseball. Joe, any word on – what the situation is going to be or when we can, because now they're starting to cancel um, spring training games. Now I've seen on the website. So any word or any idea about what's going on with that? They started canceling spring training games up to the seventh. Today was supposed to be kind of the last day, so to speak, to not have. Right. Today's uh, February 28th. Be canceled. Um, where it seems like that will be the case because I don't think they're going to get to a deal by the end of the day because it seemed like stuff was trending better yesterday from reports. And then the MLB came in more with a, like they, they said the Players Association of Players took it as a threat of saying, well, we're willing to even delay the season by a month if you guys don't basically bow down to what we've wanted for the last few months. So when something seems to be going in the right direction and then that's what the other side does the next day. Well, that's not going to send good waves the other direction. <laughs> so not that, usually, like, no. that, that, that's why I think I wouldn't be surprised if it gets to a point of the, how like it looked like it was getting going the right direction. Like somebody said this, I can't remember which analyst pointed it out, but the owner's, initiate a lockout the players initiate a strike so if you keep just shoving stupidness in their face when they keep giving you stuff that even now this is the first time in lockout years that people have started polling and they started taking people's opinions and more people are really in favor of players than owners it's been reversed more in the past with how people have felt about things where uh, i think that's also because Jeff Passon said it bluntly. We don't really love billionaires anymore. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that's kind of, and, that, and that's Jeff, kind of, I'll tell you, and Jeff is the man, <laughs> though. I mean, Jeff Passon is definitely the guy. Like, if you want any kind of Major League Baseball information, he's the man you want to check out for sure. And anything and everything Major League Baseball is that guy. You know what I mean? So when he says stuff like that, yeah. All right. So basically what you're saying is, is that, um, the the players were trying to come to an agreement. They were trying to get to. It looked like it was getting closer. Like and then like they were trying to make different compromises for each other. And then the MLB kind of slaps them across the face with that. Well, we're canceled a month for the season for a month. 
if you don't kind of capitulate to what we want. And it's like, well, it seemed like we were coming closer to it. How did we get to this? Yeah. Like, like what? Yeah. That, like... that That's why it doesn't make any sense. And I think eventually where it'll get done, I believe it's April 30th owners uh, in the end. That's why I think the players are going to realize if they're doing the threat of the season, they'll be like, okay, cool. Well, we're threatening the strike because eventually they'll probably capitulate to them because they're not going to make their TV money. Because the first checks you get for the TV money is the end of the first month of the season. Well, if there ain't no games, you ain't making any TV money as the owners because then nobody nobody played. So whoops. Th- so that is when I think eventually they're going to realize they want to get it done sooner rather than later because they're all kind of in the position of, but like I agree with. And people that say, obviously, to become a billionaire, you have to kick some people and you have to throw some people by the side to get that high at the top. Not all billionaires are bad people, but once you get that high, you kind of don't see the world for what it is anymore. So they're trying to get the um, players to kind of bow down to their means where the players are like, well, even though we have the Harpers of the world, there's a lot of guys that work jobs in the offseason because they don't get paid enough in the minor leagues or that just got called up because of the way that the arbitration process works yeah. the way all that works yeah. so it's like everyone's trying to stand up for the little guy and the league's going well the average annual salary is it's like well nobody cares what the average annual salary is because you have somebody getting paid half a billion dollars so obviously that's going to bring you know, the average yeah. so like there's different things that that's why I feel like eventually the players are kind of been playing it smarter because they know and even some have said this that I've listened to the owners eventually are not going to want to be losing money where there will probably eventually say, we might have to g- give them this. We might have to say, we're going to let them go to free agency quicker and not have that control on the whole. If they stay down for this X amount of time, you have an I extra mean, year on their contract. Yeah. Um, like that. I feel like eventually, it, even though it's re- it's pretty ugly right now, and I'd be surprised if there's a deal by the end of tonight eventually they you get to it because the owners aren't going to want to lose that whole revenue of the TV deals they have uh, for the first month of the season and going forward. That's why I think that was kind of one of those threats that they made, but are not really going to hold to it because that's not going to help them out either. And they're just going to lose a whole mil- bunch of millions of dollars worth of TV revenue. And I, but see, I think that's going to be the the thing that's going to help bring everybody to the table, which is a real shame. Is the fact that, oh, hey, the the uh, uh, the the TV money isn't coming in. Oh, well, I guess we better uh, start yeah. playing games here. Uh, uh, whoops. <laughs> so, uh, gosh, man, I'll tell you what. All right. So, Joe, thanks for all the great insight. Thanks for all of the great uh, information. Thanks for all the great stuff you do here um, at Steel Flyers All Sports Network. Um, Joe, you're also the beat writer for the Reading Royals, um, and you also write for Flyers Nitty Gritty, too, as well. And why don't you tell the folks where uh, we can find you, where we can get you, and do you have any uh, new articles coming out? Yeah, right now I've been doing more reporting uh, through videos uh, than articles because mm-hmm. with my risk coming back from sports while still also trying to play said sports, uh, typing isn't the easiest thing um, okay. with my left side. Oh, man, so, you've been putting out a lot of great videos, though, um, yeah, sure. But, yeah, so you can find me at Sports Fanatic News. JJ Boric 26 is the easiest on Twitter next week. Uh, we covered a lot of the HL today, so dipped into our top of the NHL. Yep. So we'll skip the Metro next week, and we'll go into the Atlantic for the East, and then we'll cover the West for you uh, after we do some ECHL coverage. Because yep. the ECHL, um, there's not as it'll, it'll be a little, it'll be a little bit quicker, I, I believe, because there's also not, I feel, as many teams that are in direct contention for the Kelly Cup as there is for the Calder Cup. There's more top tier teams, and then other people yeah uh, in the ECHL but still though because we like to cover 
um, Joe is 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 all about the um, the lower divisions of of the the hockey leagues, and I'm all excited about the lower divisions of the hockey league because these this is where the future comes from. This is where um, guys learn and develop their game, and this is where they become professionals, so that when they suit up for the big club, um, they're able to take care of business and do the things they need to do. So, um, thanks yeah, very like much. Yeah, like a name Joe. for Flyers fans would be Hayden Hodgson for next year because he fits the tough uh, side of. Being a folks where Wilman is the speedster. I'm with you. Uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, I am Steel Flyers, your co host. You can find me on Twitter at Steel Flyers 52. You can also find us on the web at www.steelflyers.com, where you can find all of us off the wall hockey. John, uh, Peyton on the radio. Uh, Peyton is there. Uh, Pearl of Wisdom, the great Pearl of Wisdom show is there. Hockey Writer Zinc, Lance Green is there. And then, of course, the JB and Steel show where you can get Joe Bur- the great Joe Boric and all his great stuff there, too, as well. Check us out online or on YouTube or all your platforms. Thank you very much for watching the JB and Steel show. We'll catch you the next time.